Hey class, this is the video for the checkpoints and portals lab for the designer tier. So we're going to start with adding some checkpoints and the checkpoints will save our progress as we go through a level. And there's a few things that we have to add for that to save the objects in the scene and other things like that to show our progress. Then we're going to add portals. So we'll add a portal that goes from one level to the next level. Then we'll add a portal for when you win the game. And so once we have those, we will make some screenshots and post those on open lab. So let's get started. Okay, to get started, if you have a game that you're working on, go ahead and use that game. I'm going to go over to the designer folder and go to my designer default. So this already has everything that I need to do the lab built in. So if you don't have that stuff in your game, you may need to grab it from here or from the assets folder and copy it over. So the things that we're going to need, I have some scenes in here. I have a checkpoint scene and I have a couple of different portal scenes for different portal contexts. I also have my checkpoint sprites here and here, and I have my portal sprites here and here. And I also have audio. So I have a checkpoint audio and portal audio created in the sound effects lab. And then I also have some scripts. So I have three scripts related to the checkpoints and I have two scripts related to the portal. So you're going to need all that stuff for this to work. If you're missing any of that stuff, go ahead and grab it from the designer default folder or the assets folder. And once you've got that ready to go, let's go to project.godot and go over how to implement these. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to go into my scenes and go to level one. So this is the level that I created during the level design lab. I can see that my player is kind of over in the middle because I guess I was doing some testing. So let's move the player. I assume that the player is probably just at zero, zero. So I can go to the transform and just change the X position back to zero. Uh, I guess not. So, oh, there it is. Okay, so my player is there. So that looks good. And so I'm just going to add some checkpoints and a couple portals in here. And so there's a lot of stuff already built into here that is going to make this easier to work with. But if you don't have all of this stuff, that's OK. It should still work more or less the same. And so I'm going to add the checkpoints first. The checkpoints are a little bit more complicated, but, but I'm going to add them first because it makes sense to have the checkpoints within the level before we add the portals to go to the next level or to win the game. So adding the checkpoints is actually a little bit complicated. There's three different scripts that we have to add for them to work. And that may seem kind of complicated, like a lot of the things that we have in the scene that are kind of like more important, like the player and the obstacles and stuff like that. They don't have as many scripts, but there's a reason why. And I'll try to explain that real quick before we implement the checkpoint. So I don't actually have a programming lab for this. I might add one at some point in the future, but it's actually quite complicated what we have to do to keep track of the checkpoints. It's a little bit beyond what we would cover typically in an introduction programming class. And so it's, the reason it's so complicated is because, so if we imagine we have a level, so let's say we have a level, let's just say it's a line for some reason, and we have a checkpoint in the middle. And let's say we have some coins or apples, you know, whatever your rewards are over here. And you have some more apples over here. And let's say you have a bad guy right here. Let's say it's like, uh, I guess I'm kind of drawing like a little spider. And you have another bad guy over here. So the way that we're going to implement a checkpoint is essentially when my player gets through this part of the level, so let's say they get to here, they're going to activate this checkpoint. OK, so we are going to flip the flag around this way to show that the checkpoint is activated. And then if the player falls off the edge of the game or gets eaten by the spider, instead of starting back here, the player is going to start instead at this checkpoint. So what is the problem here? The problem is that the way that we're going to do that is by actually restarting the scene. And so there's different ways that you could do this. You could change the player's spawn position. And there's lots of different ways that you could set this up. Restarting the scene gives us a little bit of an advantage. But it also makes it a little bit more complicated because let's say on the way to reaching this checkpoint, we got a couple of these apples. We killed this spider. And let's say we even got one of these apples over here. If we restart the scene, and the player arrives right here, all of these apples and spider are going to return unless we tell Godot to get rid of them. Because if we restart the scene, it's just going to create the scene again that we've already defined in Godot. So all of that stuff is going to come back. And so that's going to be a little bit confusing because we're going to say, well, I just reached the checkpoint. Shouldn't I have 
already gotten those apples, shouldn't have already defeated that spider. And so what we need is a system that is outside of our scenes. Because remember, we have these scenes where we have a player, we have a bunch of stuff, we have some bad guys, and we're going to have a checkpoint and some other stuff. And we might even have another scene where the player is going to go to that scene. Actually, we're going to add a portal. So the player will go into the portal and into the next scene. And that scene has its own uh, bad guys and apples and all sorts of stuff. And when we move from one scene to the next or back and forth, the code and everything else in the scene just disappears. And so we need to reference our global script. And what we're going to do is add a separate global script called global checkpoints. And that script has to remember where we are. So if we hit this checkpoint, then we'll tell this script so that if we die or we come back to the scene, then the script will remember to put us back at this checkpoint. But the global checkpoints is also going to remember things like, did we get this apple? Did we kill the spider? So that when we go back to the checkpoint, the scene looks like the state that it was in when we got back to it. So I have a pretty simple script for taking care of that. It's not perfect. There's a lot of ways that it might not serve your needs. So if there's something that you want to do that the script isn't doing, let me know and we could talk about how to make modifications. But I have a basic, uh, pretty simple script that is going to communicate between the different scenes and our checkpoints to make everything more or less work. So let's go over how we're going to set that up. So we have three scripts that we need to work with in our scripts folder. We have the checkpoint script, which goes in the individual checkpoint. We have the checkpoint manager, which goes in each scene. And then we have the checkpoints global. So the checkpoints global is what's going to save all of that information for us. So let's go up to project settings and go to auto load. And that's where our checkpoints global should be set up. I already have it there. And if you're using one of the default scenes, it'll already be there. But if you don't see it there, I'll show you how to do it. So let's delete that. I'm going to go choose the script. So I'm going to go to scripts and go to checkpoints global and click open. And you'll see that it creates this node name, checkpoints global. That's what we want it to be called because that's how I refer to it in the other scripts. And so we don't have to change anything there. We just have to click add. And it should say enable already, but just make sure that it's enabled. And now that should be working. The next step is to add a checkpoints node. So just like we have a node for our lives and our apples and our vines and our snakes, we need a node for our checkpoints. So I'm going to go to default scene, go to add child node, type in node 2D and click create. And then I'll hit enter to rename this. And I'm going to call this checkpoints. And we can move checkpoints above the player if we want the player to go over the checkpoints. And I'm just going to find a good place to put a checkpoint, maybe next to this heart right here. You can have as many checkpoints as you want in a level. This level isn't particularly long, but we do need to just put a checkpoint somewhere. So let's put one right on this platform here. So once we have our checkpoints node, this is where we're going to add our checkpoints manager. So I'm going to select checkpoints and then go to the script, click empty, go to load, go to scripts, and find my checkpoints manager. And this is going to save all of this information in this scene. Here, there's a couple script variables that I have to add. So if you ignore this, it shouldn't really break anything. So there's a few things that we have to add into our script variables for our checkpoint manager. So first of all, the main thing that the checkpoint does is tell the player where to go. So the first thing I need to do is assign the player path. And that's pretty easy to do. I just click on the player path in the script variables. I have to collapse all this stuff because he's all the way down here at the bottom. And then just find the player. I could probably just type in player. That's definitely easier. So then we need to assign this scene a scene name so that we can associate the objects and the spawn point with this scene. So we're just going to call this level one. And that's easy. It just matches this level one here. I didn't actually rename this over here. So let's do that here as well. So it doesn't actually matter what the scene name is. It just has to be different from the other scenes so it knows what's going on. So then this is optional, but there's an array here. And an array is basically just a list. And what we can do here is just put all of our objects in here. And so that way, our checkpoint manager will keep track of these objects. So basically, this is a little tedious because we have a lot of objects. But essentially, what I want to do is go to the scene, up the size. And every time I add to the size, it's going to give me a new value to assign. And then I can just go through and assign all of my objects. So I have a lot of objects in the scene. So this is definitely not the most 
fun way to do this. And you could do this programmatically if you were you know, being smarter than what I'm being right now. I'm almost definitely going to like skip some of these and stuff like that. Let's see if I can make this bigger so I can see the whole name. Okay, two, three, four. Okay, I skipped five and seven. Okay, so now we have to add some. Again, this is optional. If you don't care whether your objects say the same after you hit a checkpoint, then you can just skip this part. But that kind of annoys me because it kind of makes it look like the game is just restarting. So I'm just going to add in all of my snakes. And this is just going to keep track of which snakes I already killed so that I don't have to worry about killing them again. Okay, so now I've got all my snakes. And so now we have to keep going because we have more to do. So I'm going to keep adding to the size. And so I'm going to go from snakes to, well, I can't kill the vines, so that's good. So now I have these apples. Okay, I do have quite a lot of apples, don't I? Okay, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you kind of get the point. And we should see that working with the snakes if we kill some snakes. We also have the lifes. So I, there's not that many life, so I'll go ahead and add these in here. So I'll go to life and, you know, now my player will be able to infinitely collect apples, although I guess not if we prevent them from having infinite lives. So that's one good thing. Actually, I'll just type life here. That'll make this a little bit easier. And type life. Okay. So I'm not tracking everything, but I'm tracking my all of my snakes and all of my uh, extra lives. Okay, so again, that's optional. You don't need to do that, but it will make things make a little bit more sense. So now let's actually add in our checkpoint scene. So this is a pre-built scene. We're just gonna go to checkpoints, instance child scene, type in checkpoint and hit enter. It's going to, of course, add it at the origin. So let's go back here and First, we need to lock down our player. And now I should be able to move the checkpoint. And it looks really small. I wonder, is that really 64? The checkpoint looks very small. Um, I might just scale it up. But anyway, we'll put it right here. It doesn't quite fit in the grid. So let's move the grid and then move it down a little bit. And then if we want to take a look at how the checkpoint works, we can go into the scene. So here's our checkpoint scene. Let's go back to the origin. The checkpoint is really small. I can scale this up. So I'm gonna scale this up to two. Okay, so there's an animated sprite which has the active state and the idle state. If you have art that you wanna put in other than the, my art, this is where you would do it. It also has a little collision shape Let's put this on top of our art. And so the player has to enter that shape in order to activate the checkpoint. The checkpoint itself is just an area 2D and it has a node. And so when the body is entered, we can see what happens with the script. And we do have a sound here. So let's add in our sound. So we have a checkpoint sound somewhere in here. And so we can take out that comment to play the activate sound. And then the main thing that this actually does, you can see is right here, checkpoints global.update spawn position. And that takes the current position of the player and it changes what we save as the spawn position in our global script. So if we wanna take a quick look at that in the checkpoints global, you can see it's actually pretty simple in here. We're just saying update spawn position and then spawn position equals position. When we start our current scene, if it's not the scene that we have saved, then we will change the position of the player. And so it's a little tricky. Most of the work is actually happening in this kind of longer script, the checkpoint manager, which goes on that checkpoint node. And so this keeps track of all of the objects and the different scenes and the different scene names. And it checks to see, did I already start this scene? If so, you know, put the player in the spawn position or find a different spawn position based on the checkpoint. So it's doing most of the work here. But our checkpoint script is basically just saving where the player is as it goes through the level. So this should actually work. Let's go back to level one. Now that I changed the size of my checkpoint, let's move it up a little bit. And it doesn't really want to be on the grid. So let's just change the grid. 
And so we should see when we get to that checkpoint, it should change color, we should hear plot sound play, and then if we die, we should go back to that checkpoint. And there's one more thing that we have to do to make sure all this works. So in order for our checkpoints manager to save what we've collected in our playthrough, we have to connect a game over signal that comes out of the scene manager to our checkpoint. So if you go to the scene manager and you take a look at the script, there should be a little signal game over, and that should get called when we get a game over. If you don't see that, you may have a scene manager from one of the programming labs where we hadn't added this yet. So if you do see that, go ahead and grab the scene manager from the assets folder or the designer default folder and just replace it so you'll see that code. So anyway, we have to go to the scene manager and then click over to the node tab and you can see there's this game over signal. And so that's a way for the scene manager to communicate with other parts of the game that the game is over. So we can double click on that and we can find our checkpoints manager. And the reason we're using a signal here is because we don't necessarily need checkpoints in the game. And so having a signal is a way that we can have some objects listen for a specific event without necessarily having to call the checkpoints from the scene manager. So now what we can do, just take out scene manager. So the function is just called on game over. And so just make sure that matches and click connect. And if it connected, you should see this. If it didn't connect, you'll see a brand new function that says pass under it. So you should see the green arrow connecting to the function on game over. So now we've got everything that we need for this to work. So let's go ahead and practice and try the scene. And I actually got an error here because I think because of this number 19 empty array, if I click, so I just need to delete that and I think that error should go away. So that happened because I had an empty object inside of my scene objects. So let's try this again. I'm just gonna go back to level one. Okay, so now let's play through. So I'm gonna have to kill at least a couple snakes to make sure that that part works. Um, so got to do that. And I'm actually doing pretty good this run through. And so let's get that checkpoint. So you hear the sound go off, you see the flag change. So even though it doesn't like say checkpoint or anything like that, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what this is probably going to do. So let's test this. If I jump off here and lose the game and click start over, see how I appear at the checkpoint. And if I go backwards in the game, notice that those snakes are no longer there. So it's up to you. You don't have to do that. If you don't really care that there's still going to be snakes there or lives, you could just leave that out. But if you do care and you want the game to kind of change as you go through, then you can implement that checkpoints code. So let's add one more checkpoint. So you can have as many checkpoints as you want. So I'm going to zoom in on this and then go to the checkpoint, hit Command D to duplicate. And then let's move this over here. And so now we can try out the scene again. So you can put as many checkpoints as you want in. It's kind of a nice way, like if you have like a really hard jump or a really big challenge, then you can make it so the player doesn't have to do it again. So that can be kind of a nice reward for the player achieving a challenge. So let's see, oh, this one is gonna be kind of down here a little bit. So, you know, I don't wanna necessarily have to jump through all of these snakes if I die. So let's try that. And then let's see if we get killed by these snakes, we should hit the checkpoint again. So let's go to game over and there we go. Oh, these snakes are activate on detection. So they are waiting for me to move. And so there we go, my checkpoints work pretty well. So that's the basic idea. And you can put checkpoints in other levels. If you have different art, you can swap in the art, but that's pretty much what we need to do for that section. So now that we've added our checkpoints, let's go ahead and add some portals. So we have two different types of portals that we can use in this game. One is to end a level and go to the next level. So what it actually does is essentially when the player enters the portal, it just transports them into a new level. Really what it's doing is just opening a new scene. And you can change that scene to be whatever you want. The other type of portal is going to be what I call an end game portal. And it just brings up the end game UI. You could also just go to a scene that just says you win the game or has some credits or some narrative component or something like that. So really you could use 
the next level portal for both of these situations. But in the situation that you just want to bring up some UI, you could also do that with other types of events. It doesn't necessarily have to be a portal. It could be like a sign that you run into that then triggers some UI. So you could use these different scenes very differently depending on what you want to do. But the basic idea is just to kind of have a portal to end the game or go to the next level. So let's do the next level one first, since we are on level one here, we can put a portal over here. I'm gonna move my player over so I don't have to spend a lot of time testing. So let's grab the player, oops. And move the player over. I keep accidentally grabbing the camera. So let's lock the camera. So let's grab the player and move the player over here. And I'll just put the player right here in a nice safe platform with the heart and they'll just have to get down to where the portal is. So next thing to do, the portals are actually very simple compared to the checkpoints. They have their own scene and their own script and they don't really have to communicate with anything else. So let's go to level one and we'll add a child node and let's add a node 2D and we'll call this portals. I'm only going to have one portal, but you could have more than one. You could have different portals that go to different scenes. And so let's grab this portal and then we're going to go to instance child scene. And the default portal scene should be in the scenes folder if you're using the designer default. If not, you can grab it from the assets folder or the designer default folder. And I'm going to start with the portal next level. So I'm going to click open and that actually is of course, all the way at the beginning of the scene, but let's move it over here using the position. So I'm gonna see what the position of the player is. It's 4256. So I'm just gonna copy that, go to my portal next and paste that into the X. And there we go. That's a slightly easier way to grab our portal. So there's our portal. I meant for it to kind of like blend in with the ground. It doesn't really do that super well, but that's okay. So let's take a look at what's in the portal scene and then we'll try it out. So if we click on the portal and go to the portal scene, you can see, let's center this. Oops, there it is. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. You have the animated sprite with the idle and active animations. This is where you would replace the art if you made your own art or you're working with another student. And then we have a collision shape. Let's move this down here so we can see it. And the collision shape is actually pretty small compared to the rest of the portal, but as long as the player hits somewhere in there, and I want it to be kind of inside of the rest of the portal so that it doesn't activate before the player actually gets fully inside. And then we have an activation sound, which isn't filled in. So let's go to load, go to audio and find our portal sound. And so now we have the sound set up. The animated sprite has a signal. So something that we did with a lot of the other labs is that we created this animation finished event to update something. So when we hit the portal, we wanna actually watch an animation before we go to the next level or win the game or whatever it does. So instead of, having the first signal, which we have a signal on the area 2D that goes to the body entered, that's gonna activate the sprite. And then when the animation is done, that's what this signal is for. So that goes to our on animated sprite finished. We're gonna activate the portal. And then if the portal is active and the portal animation finishes, then we are going to go to the next level. And the load level path is an export variable that we are going to need to fill in for each different portal. So each portal can go to whatever level we put in the specific level that we're editing so we can have the same portal be used in lots of different levels. So there's one thing that we wanna change in here. Let's add the sound in since we do have a sound and all this stuff is already connected. So we don't really have to change anything else in here. So that looks good. So let's go back to level one. And so all we have to do is decide what path we wanna to go to, what scene we wanna open. So we don't actually have a level two. So I'm going to just go to scenes and go to level one. And I'm just gonna duplicate this, call it level two. It's gonna be the same thing, but we can make some changes in the future. And so for now, we're just gonna to go to level two. So I'm gonna click on scenes and go to level two and click open. Let's just do this. So I'm gonna to go to level two really quickly. I'm gonna to go to my platforms and let's see, here's my, I've got level two open. It's the same thing as level one. We'll update this in a later lab, but just so we can see, I'm just gonna change the color. So I'm gonna grab my platforms and let's make them kind of blue. 
So that'll at least kind of show us that we're in a different level. And then did I use, so let's, let's copy this. So let's go to our auto tiles. And so I want to make sure to use the same color. So I'm going to open this and grab the hex value and then go to the auto tiles, go to visibility, modulate and paste in that hex value. And okay, cool. So now we have, whoops, now we have a different color. So it's going to be clear that we're on a new level. So we'll know that this actually worked. Probably not necessary, but just wanted to do that. And so now if we play this scene, so we just need to make it down here. And we should see the portal. We get the sound, we get the animation, and now we are on a new level. And it looks like my player is in the end of the level. That's because I didn't actually change where the player was when I duplicated the level. So it's in the same place on both levels. And that's fine. So let's close this up. So that's our next level portal. Let's go to level two. And here we'll add our end game portal. So I'm going to go to my portals in the scene manager. And this is a pretty similar. I just hit F to focus the portal. Um, this is actually going to look exactly the same, but it's a different scene. So I'm just going to delete this and click OK. And I'm going to go to portals and I'm going to instance a child scene and type portal end game. And that's going to be at zero, zero again. So I kind of forget what the X value is. I think it was like 4250, something like that. Oh, pretty close. OK, so this is our end game portal. And what this does, it doesn't go to a new scene. All it does is activate a UI. So the end game portal acts a little bit differently than the next level portal. So the end game portal actually interacts with the scene manager, unlike the next level portal, which just takes you to the next level. So if you win the game, you might want to update other things in the scene manager. You could set it up just so that you just tell it what UI to open, especially if it's not necessarily doing the win game one. But since we have the scene manager set up, this is a good way to do it. So again, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but this is just the way it's set up. So the first thing that we can do, let's actually update our portal because we can change the color of this one as well. So uh, let's remember, what did I do for the platforms? Just grab this color and then go to the portal. So we can actually change the color here to match the rest of the scene. So that looks pretty cool. So this portal actually has a node, a signal on it. And so we just have to connect the signal from the portal and game to the scene manager. So I'm going to go to on activate, double click, choose the scene manager and click connect. And this should connect to a function that says win game. If it doesn't, you might have the wrong scene manager script. Just go grab it from the assets. But you should see a green uh, signal that connects to this function that says win game here. Um, if it generated a new function that says pass, then you're missing that script. So this win game will call the win game function up here. And all that does is make the, the win game UI visible. So let's give that a test. And so we can go down here and we can go to the portal. And there we go. So it activates, we see the little animation, and then it says you win. Uh, we probably want to make the player stop being able to move at that point, but that's OK. And then we can start over or we can quit. And for you win, we could probably, I'm not sure what start over will do. It probably doesn't do anything. So we probably need to fill that in, but we can just click the quit button. So I don't think I've done this before, but if we go to start over, you can see there's a load level. And so if we want to start over, we could go back to the start menu and make that go there. And so let's try that again, just to make sure. So we're just going to get to the end of the game. So it says you win. And if we click start over, then we go to the start level, which looks like is not set up either. But you get the idea. If you have your start menu set up, that should work. So that's basically all that you have to do with the portal end game. You could also have a portal next level that just opens the you win scene all by itself. Or you could add some other scene with some cool song or some graphics or some animation or something like that. But that's just the basic idea. There's a couple different ways that we can change the state of the game using a portal. It could be a door. It could be stairs. You know, it could be a lot of different things. So that's everything that we want to do in this lab. So let's do a little bit of documentation. I'm going to go back to level one and let's get a documentation of our checkpoint. Um, so we actually have to go backwards a bit. Let's see. 
There's a checkpoint up there. Can I get there? Oops. Let's kill the snake. And so let's take a screenshot of the checkpoint. Um, I guess we'd already activated it. So let's go back to this other checkpoint and take a screenshot of that. So we've got our two checkpoint states. That's good enough for here. Then let's go to the end of the level. And so we go back here. Can I get past here? I guess I can. And so there's our end level portal. And then we have our level two. And we can kind of show off our cool blue level that we've got going on over here. And so here's our end game portal. And if you want to put in the you win scene, go ahead and add that in there too. So we documented everything that we need for this project. So let's go ahead and quit Godot. And so let's post our documentation on the open lab. I'm going to go to new post and I'll add in the category. So this is for checkpoints and portals. This is the designer lab. And we'll say checkpoints, portals in my level design. And so this is really so that we can start designing more complex games with more than one level or with really long levels. So we say here are my checkpoints. And this isn't actually in the right order, but let's just show the yellow checkpoint first. And then the purple checkpoint. And the portals. And so then we have the pink portal. Oops, I don't know why this is up here. Let's move this down. And the purple portal. And the end of the game. Okay, this goes down here. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Let's preview that. Okay, so we have our checkpoints and our portals. And so that's good. If you got those working, then we can go design more levels, add more parts to our game, and do lots of other stuff to make our game more complicated. So this looks good. Let's go ahead and publish.